Good morning, church. This is Harrison Hanna. Harrison, do you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Yes. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my brother, Harrison Hanna, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're happy to announce that Harrison is debuting our brand new baptism shirt. <laughs> this young man is handsome as he can be. Thank you, Harrison. You head on up. Let's pray together. <laughs> Father, thank you for the joy that is ours today to continue in this time of worship with the baptism of Harrison. Thank you so much for bringing him to faith in your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for his family. Bless them today with untold amounts of joy. Be with us now as we uh, celebrate that our Savior lives. And what a perfect picture uh, this is as we have already witnessed Harrison's baptism. Guide us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
says, This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we just praise your name this morning for who you are. We praise you for your power, the greatest display of which, of course, is in the raising of your dead son back to life, our Savior. We not only are in awe of you for this, but we thank you for this as well. Thank you for ordering our steps to be in this room for these few moments as we've gathered to celebrate that our Savior lives for this is Resurrection Sunday. And we rejoice and we are exceedingly glad in all that you have done for us through the person of Jesus Christ. We pray that everything that is done and said in this time of worship would bring glory only to you May Christ be exalted among us and your spirit move with great freedom this morning, speaking to all of our hearts, meeting us at our point of need, drawing us close to you just as we are. We thank you for what you're going to do here in these few moments. We give you the glory in advance, and I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, my name is John Hall, and I am the pastor here at Field Street Baptist Church, and it is my joy today to welcome you to worship here at Field Street. If you're a guest with us today, we are especially pleased that you've made the effort to be a part of this gathering. And we would delight in knowing of your presence here this morning. You can simply uh, let us know by completing a communication card. That card is in the pew in front of you. If you would, take that card and complete it at some point during the service. And later, when the offering plate is passed, you can drop this card inside the offering plate. And we would delight in knowing of your attendance here with us today. Thank you for being here. Let me ask you to stand to your feet yet again, and let's greet those around us. If you don't know those standing next to you, please introduce yourselves today. Thank you for being in worship this morning at Field Street. Seat, you may be seated as our choir sings for us.
Herod was filled with wrath. The babe is now a man, teaching a new doctrine with compassion and authority. The people are following him. The chief priests and the elders are outraged. There's a mob outside of Pilate's hall today. Something's happening. beneath the load of the cross. His mother ran to him. Soldiers pushed her away. I heard the hammer fall and I knew the nails had been driven and he was on the cross. The scoffers kept chanting. I heard him speak words of forgiveness. There was darkness over the earth and a great earthquake. Then I heard him cry from the cross, it is finished. We watched him die, but somewhere in my being I knew this was not over. Joseph's grave where Jesus of Nazareth has laid three days in the morning in the morning how the earth began to quake some things happening at Joseph's grave I invite you to stand as we worship our risen Savior. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. 
Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began, ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart is given. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, faithfully And he canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Rested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Is your
God's Son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon and empty graves there to prove my Savior lives because He lives I can face tomorrow because He Many cry. 
bearing all my sin and shame in love you this morning. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? In a moment, I want us to turn to the Gospel of John, where we will look into chapter 11, verses 17 through 27. But before we get to the sermon text in John's Gospel, we must read from the definitive statement in all of the scripture regarding the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it's important to us as followers of Christ. So please open your Bibles first to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, find verse 12, and we're going to read just five verses from 1 Corinthians 15. Now because this is such a special Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we cannot read these verses sitting down. Would you please stand for just a few more moments as we read verses 12, 14, 15, 17, and 20. Don't worry. I'll direct your attention to these. Beginning in verse 12, the Apostle Paul writes, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Verse 14, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching 
is useless, and so is your faith. Verse 15. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he has raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. Then verse 17, which you could argue is the most important verse in all of the Bible. Verse 17 says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Finally, verse 20, Paul says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Let's pray together. Thank you for the declaration of Holy Scripture that you, Father, have raised your Son from the dead. And we are here this morning to celebrate this incredible truth and reality. And thank you for the hope that gives us. Thank you that we can face tomorrow because Jesus Christ lives. And we thank you that even now our Savior is seated at your right hand, interceding on our behalf according to your will. Lord, we ask that your spirit would open our minds and our hearts to what you want to say to each one of us this morning through this message. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. For a number of years now, it has been my humble and consistent contention that the single most important event in all of human history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The physical, literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is absolutely the linchpin, the cornerstone, the foundation, and the hinge point of the entire Christian faith. So today is not business as usual. This is not like any other Sunday on the Christian calendar. This is Resurrection Sunday when we celebrate that Jesus lives. Perhaps you heard the story about a, a Sunday school teacher who was taking her little boys and girls to church and on the way to big church, she asked the question, boys and girls, why is it so important that we are quiet in church? And one smart little girl with a twinkle in her eye said, because people are sleeping. <laughs> now, this is not a day in which you can sleep, folks. You want to be wide awake for the experience we have uh, together as we've come to celebrate that Jesus lives. So you can't sleep today, absolutely not. Or maybe you heard the story about this little girl named Angie. She, she was six years old, and her brother Joel was four years old. Her and Joel were sitting together in big church, and Joel giggled, sang, talked out loud, and finally his big sister had had enough. You're not supposed to talk out loud in church, Joel. Why? Who's going to stop me? And Angie pointed to the back of the church where two men were standing. He said, you see those men back there? They're hushers. <laughs> hushers. <laughs> That's a little humor to soften you up a bit. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said, you got to tickle the oyster before you can stick the knife in. So, anyway, in all seriousness, I would like to express my personal appreciation that you are here today. I'm so grateful. It's wonderful that you are here, and I very much appreciate the effort you've made to be a part of this worship service. Today is such a special day. In fact, I would argue that, that it's, it's far more special than the opening day at the depot. Remember that? It's more special than Super Bowl Sunday. It's more special than the first time you got your own uh, cell phone, you bought your first home, purchased your first car. Today is Resurrection Sunday. Today, as the redeemed of God, we celebrate that Jesus lives. But I want to ask you a personal question, and I implore you, please do not answer it out loud. The question is, why did you come? Why are you here? Why am I here? You know, all across the nation this morning, People are going to houses of worship that, that may not necessarily attend a, a worship service any other time of the year. So it's a fair question. Why are you here and why are you here today? I read this study that broke my heart this week. It's a study that says and reveals that, uh, that the constituency of our country is far less religious than ever before in the history of our nation. So why are you here? You know, some would say, well, listen, you don't miss church on Easter, you don't miss church on Christmas, and you sure don't miss church on Mother's Day. 
Some would say, well, my spouse dragged me here. <laughs> uh, some would say, well, I needed, to, uh, I needed a little goodwill. I need to make a deposit in God's bank. And I figure that showing up at church on Resurrection Sunday ought to get me some credit with the man upstairs for another year. Some would say, my pastor didn't give me a choice. Others would say that you're here because you want to be here. You can't think of anywhere else you would rather be on Resurrection Sunday. And still others, maybe you came today because uh, you need a little boost. You need a spiritual shot in the arm, so to speak, because your tank is running a bit on empty. You stop to think about it, you're emotionally drained, physically tired, you're tired and worn out, you see no end in sight of your personal anguish due to a variety of circumstances, and when you stop and think about it, you, you come to the conclusion you're stressed out. You're worried about your kids, and if you're not worried about your kids, then you're worried about your grandkids, and if your parents are still alive, then you're worried about your aging parents, you're worried about paying the bills, you're worried what's going on with this country, you're worried about your health, your job seems more routine these days than when it was once the kind of the passion of your heart. Maybe you're carrying around this load of guilt over some secret sin. Uh, you put on a good front, but deep down you're hurting and you wonder if anyone really cares. You have these broken relationships in your life. You wonder how God could even love you in the first place with all of your flaws, dysfunctions, and carnalities. You can't seem to get past the grief that weighs you down. Frankly, you feel depressed, sometimes discouraged, and you wonder if God even knows you're alive. Let me put that notion to rest. God knows you're alive, and he cares very much. So whatever the reason, the good news is you're here, and I want to thank you for that. And I believe that God ordered your steps because I read the Bible and that's what the Bible says, that God orders our steps and appoints our times and you're here by divine design. And only you can answer the question exactly why you're here. But with that said, I want to say to you now, I have good news for you today. And it will be the best news you've heard all day, maybe all this week or maybe even since the beginning of this year, January 1 of 2024. So with all that said, Please open your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 11. And I want to begin reading in verse 17 through verse 27. Now, John's Gospel is book number four in the New Testament. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So find John's Gospel, then chapter 11, verse 17 and following. And these words are so great to consider on this very special day, Resurrection Sunday. So beginning in verse 17, John records, On his arrival, the Bible says, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Now when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, well, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. I want to ask you what Jesus asked to Mary. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? It's such a great question, especially when you consider who it is that is asking the question. Now, let me give you a little context uh, surrounding this passage of scripture. It's helpful to know. It turns out that Jesus was very close. He had a great friendship with this little family that lived in Bethany, which was near Jerusalem. And when Lazarus became sick, Lazarus' sisters sent an urgent message to Jesus about Lazarus' sickness. Now, inexplicably, Jesus, the Bible tells us, did not respond until many days later. When Jesus finally did arrive, Lazarus was gone. Lazarus was dead. 
Now, that's very interesting because it's only two miles from Bethany to Jerusalem, maybe even less than that. And all of us in this room could walk that distance quite easily in less than an hour. But Jesus, he doesn't arrive as soon as those thought he should. Now, a sizable crowd had gathered at the home of Mary and Martha. Why, why were they there? Well, it turns out that an essential duty of Jewish piety was to engage in comforting the bereaving family. And Bethany, as I've already stated, was less than two miles from Jerusalem, so many were able to make that quick trip and go and minister to this grieving family. So three days, this is also interesting, three days after death were called days of weeping which were then followed by what we know as four days of lamentation for a grand total of seven days of mourning. Now, this is even more interesting. According to rabbinical thought, the spirit wanders about the grave for three days, seeking an opportunity to return into the body. But when the aspect of the body changes, it hovers no more, but leaves the body to itself. So the friends of the deceased were then in the habit of visiting the grave for three days after death and burial, probably because, as they supposed, they would thus be nearer to the departed soul. So when the fourth day came and decomposition took place and the soul, as they supposed, went away from the grave, they would then beat their breasts and make loud lamentations. That explains the allusion in John's gospel to the four days in this text in verse 39. So the saying that one had been in the grave four days was equivalent to saying the bodily corruption had begun. He's dead. And Jesus knows exactly what he's doing and the timing of what he's going to do. Now in verse 20, if you look at that verse again, we read that Martha, upon hearing that Jesus was coming, went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. And then in verse 21, Martha exclaims, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus responds beautifully by saying, Your brother will rise again. At which Mary declares, yeah, I know that. He he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. It's almost as if Martha is saying, I got that silly. I know that. But what Jesus is saying, it's so important to remember this and to note that what Jesus meant when he said this was, Lazarus is going to live again in a few moments. And if you'd like to read ahead in chapter 11, it all takes place at verse 43. So Martha meant the future resurrection at the last day. And you know, of course, that one of the core doctrines of the Christian faith is the bodily resurrection of Jesus and the impending future bodily resurrection of the believing dead. You say, well, where is that found in the Bible? I have to read that. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 13 through 17. Listen to this. This is fantastic on Resurrection Sunday. In verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul writes, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, We tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever." Great verses. Now look at verse 25. And here we have the Lord's fifth, what we call I am statements. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. 
Do you believe this? Do you believe this? All who believe in Jesus, Jesus says, even though they experience physical death, will live for eternity. Even though a believer in Jesus Christ dies physically, he or she will live for eternity. You know what? The truth is, Jesus never once promised us anywhere in Scripture that God was going to bubble wrap his people and prevent them from experiencing physical death, pain, or suffering. In fact, we all know faithful followers of Christ who have experienced tremendous heartache. Christ followers who have gone bankrupt. Christ followers who've been diagnosed with brain tumors. Christ followers who've buried their children. Christ followers who've battled and eventually succumbed to cancer. Christ followers whose homes have been ravaged by natural disasters. Christ followers followers who've been robbed, beaten, and left for dead. Christ followers who have suffered intense persecution. Christ followers who have suffered all kinds of physical maladies. But I'm here to tell you one thing for sure this morning. For those who have put their belief in Jesus Christ, physical death is not the end. Jesus came to give us the abundant life now, but more importantly and far more significantly, the opportunity to be right with God and anticipate an eternity spent in fellowship with Him in His presence. And Jesus said Himself, I am the resurrection, and the life. The question is, do you believe this? Well, Martha did. Don't you love Martha? Martha did. I want you to look at her statement of faith very quickly. Her response is exactly what Jesus would desire from us. Martha says, you're the Christ. You're the Son of God. You're the one who was to come into the world. The the greatest miracle was and is Jesus' power to give endless spiritual life to all who believe in Him. You know what the two greatest miracles are ever that God has done? Obviously, His power was put on glorious display when He raised His dead Son back to life by His power. No one's ever done that. God did it. And secondly, when God saves a sinner, that is the power of God on display when God saves us, brings us out of spiritual darkness into the light and changes our status from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive. It's one of the greatest miracles ever. And this miracle can happen to all and any who will repent of their sin, who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who will confess that Jesus is the Son of God, who will commit themselves to Him. Say, how do you know that? I've read about it in Romans 10. The scripture says, For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. And Christ demonstrates his power over death. Therefore, I can say in all confidence and with the authority of the Bible that there's no circumstance in your life this morning over which Christ is not sovereign and in which he is impotent to help. So you have to answer the question for yourself. Do you believe this? The truth is some will, some won't. It has always been this way. Some will outright reject the Bible's claims about Jesus, or even Jesus' claims about himself. But there are others who will believe. Others will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and the only one who can save them from their sin. Some will respond in repentance and faith, and some will seek this very moment the forgiveness of God and put their trust in Christ. Oh, dear people, you know why I'm here today? There's some of you that are the more cynical type, and I love you because I can be that way too. Some of you are like, I know why you're here, because you're paid to be here, brother. That's not why I'm here today. I'm here today because I'm the Lord's herald. I'm just a trumpet. I'm just a mouthpiece for the Word of God. And I'm here to, de- uh, to declare boldly that Jesus lives. Verse 20, 1 Corinthians 15 Paul says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. 
So the greatest event in all of human history paved the way for all who repent and believe to be saved from their sin and to have a relationship with God through Christ. That's the good news. How will you respond? May I suggest you come to Jesus this morning that you lay your burdens down at His feet, that you lay your sins before His cross, receive His grace, His mercy, and His forgiveness. You say, you know what, I want to do that. How do I do that? I urge you, come just as you are. The Father will draw you to His Son, as the Bible says, and you come just like you are, and He will take it from there. I wonder if you would be willing, as I wrap this message up this morning, to sing along with me a hymn right out of the good old Baptist hymn. It's a hymn that everyone knows. In fact, I would venture to say a large majority of United States adults have sung this hymn and embraced it even. I bet you know the hymn is called Just As I Am. Now I want you to sing it with me and, and don't listen to my voice, listen to the words. Just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee O Lamb of God I come I Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to Thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God I come, I come. Do you believe this? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the power of the Scripture. Thank you for your power that raised your dead son back to life on the third day. Thank you that you will save any and all who will cry out to you in repentance and faith. And I pray for our responses in this very moment that your spirit will direct each one of us as to what we are to do. And regarding the question, do you believe this? Lord, I do. I do. And I thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving my wife and my children. I pray for any present this morning that has not yet experienced the new birth, that today would be the day of salvation to your glory. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. We're going to sing a song of response. Perhaps your response this morning would be, you know what? You've asked the question, do you believe this? And I do. And I want to be saved. I want to come to Christ. I urge you to do that this morning. You come in repentance and faith in Jesus, and he will take it from there and make you what he wants you to be. Will it be easy? Absolutely not. Will it be worth it? Absolutely yes. If you've never given your life to Christ, please do so today. Don't leave here wondering if you're right with the Lord. You can know for sure. Now, for others of you, that's probably everybody else, what should you do this morning? May I suggest that right where you stand on this special day, you just say, Father, thank you that you raised Jesus back to life from the dead. Because of that, we are no longer condemned in our sins. If Jesus was still dead, we are condemned. I'm quite certain that would be an expression that God himself would find such delight and hearing his children thank him for the resurrection of his son. Would you do that? Maybe others would come this morning uniting with our church. If that's God's plan for you, we would receive you warmly. I wish I knew what you should do, and I would tell you. 
but I don't. That is, as I've said so many times, between you and God. I'll stand here at the front this morning to receive any that might feel compelled to come publicly today. These moments are over very, very quickly. So I urge you to respond as God's Spirit prompts you. Would you stand to your feet, please, as we extend this time of response? You come. Just as I am without one please, but that thy blood was shed for thee, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God. Please be seated for a few moments more. Our hushers are coming forward this morning as uh, we now prepare to receive the offering. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a glorious hour of worship. And uh, it's just a joy to be here today on such a special day. Thank you for all our guests. Thank you, uh, Lord, for just being with us, helping us to celebrate that Jesus lives. And now as we have the opportunity to give back, Pray that especially today we'll give back out of sheer gratitude for what you've done for us in the risen Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. They put a thorned crown on his head. Forced to carry his own cross up on the hill. And the other one said... Um, we're criminals and we des deserve to die. Jesus died on the cross, saved us from our sins, and then rose again after three days. They wrapped him with bandages. He put him in a cave and rolled the tomb in front of it. And two guards were making sure that nobody stole Jesus. Teaching the people that already died. Sit there and maybe sleep. Made a plan, maybe? Three days later, there was an earthquake. Angel came. Our got scared and ran away. Angels knocked around the Angel came down. Angel was so bright that um that the soldiers fell down. Yeah. Down. Mary? And two other women, they came by with some perfume and nice spices. Lotions, and I think they were going to rub it on his skin. Mary came to the uh, tomb, and she said, where's Jesus? They freaked out because he wasn't in the tomb. The angel said, Jesus is, has rose. Tell uh, Jesus' friends that he has rose from the dead. He told the disciples that, that, that someone had took Jesus' body. Jesus is dead. He, he's not come there. They said he's alive, and they were very surprised. They were very, very happy, and they said, Do what I have done to you. Make more disciples out in the world. Why is he rising? Why is he going to heaven? He just um, came back from being dead. Confused. Very, very confused. And happy. Probably take a picture or something to remember it. Okay, Miss Anne, we will do what you have said. We will make more disciples for you.
We really do work here, believe it or not. Uh, tell you what. Anyway. Okay. Uh, it's, it's such a joy to present to you this morning Annabelle Morrow. Annabelle, would you come stand here at the front? And I'll have your parents join you, Gayla. And, of course, Jonathan, if you all stand with your daughter. Annabelle is coming today to let us know she's already trusted Christ as her Savior, but now desires to follow the Lord's example and his command in scriptural baptism. And so we welcome Annabelle. Yes. So we welcome her into our church family by her profession of faith and desire to be baptized. If you're thrilled as I am uh, to welcome Annabelle in this fashion, would you raise your right hand and say amen? Amen. And that's everyone. And in a few moments, uh, on your way out, if you would uh, come by and extend the right hand of Christian fellowship and also just a word of encouragement to Annabelle as we rejoice in what God has done in her heart and life through Christ and then her desire to be baptized. Would you stand to your feet as we have a closing word of prayer? Thank you for being here this morning. We're just delighted uh, to gather today to celebrate that Jesus lives. Thank you for coming this morning. Lord, be with us now as we depart and help us to go encouraged, knowing that our Savior lives, and because he lives, we can face whatever might stare us down. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for your incredible power in raising your son back to life. I pray, Father, that you'll be pleased with our efforts to live in a manner worthy of him. Thank you for the one that you've added to us today. Bless her and her family. Be with us now as we depart. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. Come and greet these.